Your Royal Highness, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming here this evening to hear about Durrell's new strategy. As Lee said, we want to create a wilder, healthier and more colourful world. Now, as a vision, we wanted it to be bold, but also we wanted it to be optimistic. It's more than stopping extinction. It's much more than that. It's about a healthy, wonderful, flamboyant, colourful planet. So we're going to set out this evening how we're going to do that and how we think you can help us. Now, our strategy runs till 2025, and that's because our founder, Gerald Durrell, would have been 100 years old. So we think it's very fitting in his centenary year that we set out some bold targets. So what do we want to see from our strategy by 2025? We want to see 10 ecosystems being rewilded. We want to see 100 threatened species on the road to recovery, 500 endangered species projects that work more effectively, and 1 million people better connected to nature. That's what we want to achieve as Durrell, working with our partners like the Wild Network. It's ambitious, but we think we should be ambitious because it's a big task. So we're very excited about the future. But what's rewilding? Rewilding is more than stopping species become extinct. It's more than saving habitats. Rewilding is making sure that ecosystems function, that key species are still there, that they work without us being involved. At some future point, we want to be able to take our hands off and our systems work again. So it's a much more ambitious and it's a much more positive way at looking at conservation. To restore the colour of a planet, we're going about it in a certain way. We want to recover threatened species, revive ecosystems, reconnect people to nature, and bring that all together in our responsibility for the natural world. So we start the first one, recover. Now, for, for Durrell, that's very much what we are known for, our intensive care approach to species conservation. When we work with species, we work with them for a very long time. We learn about them, we work out how to breed them, we work out what they need, and then we put them back in the wild. This is a pochard from Madagascar, the rarest duck in the world. Not everyone gets excited about ducks, but we do. We think ducks are great, and ducks have a place. We've been working with the ducks for a while now, but 2018 is going to be a very exciting year because it's the year we start to put them back on Lac Sophia. We start to return them to the wild. So we're very excited about the next year to come in Madagascar. We want to revive ecosystems. We want to remove the invasive species, put back the key species that fulfill important ecological functions, and we want to create resilient ecosystems, the healthy part of our vision. And we're working with partners to establish 10 rewilding sites worldwide. Everything you hear this evening is in partnership. We don't work in isolation. Conservation does not work in isolation. We need our partners and the communities in which we work. We're going to reconnect people with nature. Fantastic talk from David. And I think it was important when he described the science that underpins this. Because often in the past, I think ideas around reconnection have seemed woolly to some people. It's a term that's uh, not very nice to call someone a tree hugger. And yet, and yet, just in the past few weeks, there was a study by the Max Planck Institute that showed that people who live near forests have more robust amygdala in their brain. Our brain structures are affected by where we live, by connecting to nature. In the video right at the start, uh, one of the children said, in an endless universe where life is so rare, there's a precious planet that we wild things share. We wild things. And we've forgotten that we are a part of nature, not apart from nature. We've become domesticated as a species, and that's not that good for us. So we're going to use our zoo in Jersey, 
our outreach all over the world, and we're going to work to connect people to nature by understanding the pathways to connection, working with people like the Wild Network, working with our academic collaborators at the University of Derby, who have a nature connectedness unit, and we're going to figure out how we can do this most effectively. And when people are connected emotionally to nature, that's when they're going to take responsibility for nature. That's when they're going to make a difference in their behaviour. We are a quite amazing species. We have immense power. We can change the planet, and we are changing the planet. But we can change the planet for good. We can make it better again when we take responsibility. Now, we saw a picture earlier, the rarest duck in the world. This is the rarest tortoise in the world, also from Madagascar, the plowshare. Fantastic animal. And our team in Madagascar take full responsibility, passionate responsibility, for making sure that this species does not disappear. Because someone's got to love the tortoises too. So I'm going to run you through the rewilding sites. Where are we going to work? Now, we've chosen our rewilding sites very specifically. They're representative of the world's biomes, terrestrial biomes. They're places where we might have legacy of work. They're places that need conservation. And they're also places where we can develop the science of rewilding and we can then apply it further afield. So where are we working? Are we going to be working in the Madagascar wetlands? We have a long history there. We're going to be working alone in places like Lac Alotra. This is an Alotran gentle lemur. We'll be working with species like Ray Ray and Pond Heron. Wetlands are probably the most degraded ecosystem in Madagascar. And yet millions of people absolutely rely for their livelihoods on wetlands. So by working in these wetlands, we're going to be working with communities and helping their lives improve as well. Because of course, Madagascar, anywhere we work, conservation is not in isolation from people. It has to work for people as well. We're going to be working in the dry forest in St. Lucia. This is a very interesting project. St. Lucia is under a great deal of threat from invasive species, from urban development for the tourism industry. And what's happening is the endemic species are being pushed to the margins, and often they're being pushed to offshore islands, tiny offshore islands where they're even more vulnerable to extinction. And we're going to be establishing what's called a mainland island. We're going to be working with very rare species, such as the St. Lucian racer. It's a snake, the rarest snake in the world. You can see there's a pattern here. <laughs> the rarest snake in the world, and a number of other species, and we're going to be managing it on the mainland and try and see if this idea of a mainland island will work. But we also work closer to home, of course. Our headquarters is on Jersey. It's a very small island, nine by five. And we're going to be working specifically on the coastland habitats. This is a chuff. This is our beautiful red-billed chuff. For 100 years, they were missing from Jersey. They were gone. There's a lot of agriculture on Jersey. There's lots of pressure on the land. And the chuffs had disappeared. So a few years ago, we began again with our partners. And we brought the chuffs back to Jersey. And we set up a release aviary on the cliffs in the north. And over time, the chuffs went out. And now, if you go to the north of the island, you can see the chuffs all flying around, chattering. They're very noisy, making lots of noise, pecking at the ground. And they're also breeding and rearing their chicks. We've still got a long way to go. We're going to keep our hands on there for a long time. But it is working, and the chuffs are back. One place we don't currently work is Britain. And yet Britain has some of the most degraded landscapes in the world. We're a very crowded island. We have lots of agriculture. And we thought we should also work here. And we're going to be looking at projects in the temperate forests. We're going to be working with iconic species, white-tailed sea eagles and beavers, white storks, pine martens, wildcats. And we're talking to a number of organizations at the moment about how we can work together to rewild at landscape level parts of Britain. It's a very exciting opportunity. I mentioned earlier that we work in partnership. 
Our project on the Floriana Island and the Galapagos is a good example of uh, a project which is actually very large. We're one of many, many partners. But we've been brought into this project for our specific intensive care approach to species. We will be working to return species like the Floriana racer back to the island and the Floriana mockingbird. That's a big project. It's a, it's a, a, a significant project that has lots of partners. But uh, we're very excited about the opportunity of working with groups like Island Conservation to bring that island back into pristine condition, to healthy, resilient condition. Back in Madagascar again, but this time in the dry forests. Dry forests are under huge pressure. Around the area of Menebe, where we work, there's enormous pressure from overgrazing from cattle, from uncontrolled fire, from pressure for charcoal production, cash crops for an international market like peanut oil. It's very difficult for the people there. So we're working with local communities to help them develop strategies of how they can use the land better, how it can be more resilient for them. We're working with species such as the giant jumping rat, you saw one in the film earlier, uh, aye, aye mouse lemurs, my personal favourite, the fossa, which is, it's like a small, short-legged puma with Mickey Mouse ears. <laughs> I did my PhD on the fossa, so I'm a little biased there, but it's <laughs> the best animal in the world. So there's lots of exciting species and fantastic communities that we can work with. We're going to be working in Brazil. We've started working there already. Now you can see that hard, hard line where the wild stops and agriculture begins. This is a significant problem because the forest has been broken up and you get patches of forest and the animals can't move between the forests. So what we've been doing in Brazil is creating corridors of forest allowing the tamarins, in particular the species that we concentrate on there, the tamarins to move back and forward to have connectivity in the forest again. Now, it's, it's quite a challenging project because the tamarins have to be persuaded to use the corridors. They're a little nervous. So we've been testing things like artificial nest boxes. We've been testing them back in the zoo in Jersey, working out the best way to use them, and then putting them into the corridors because... The corridors are quite young. They don't often have the right kind of tree holes where they would like to nest. And we're going to take all our experience with the black line tamarins that we've been working with for decades now and apply it to this project. We're going to be working on the Mauritius offshore islands. We have a long history in Mauritius. <coughs> but what we really want to do is use the round island as a model for how you rewild an island. It's complex. We've been doing translocations from other islands, bringing back species like Telfair skinks, round island boas. But we've also been looking at what's missing from the island. What's missing from the island are the giant tortoises that used to be there that no longer exist. So we have to be creative. They were the engineers of the landscape. So what we've done is we've taken tortoises from places like Aldabra and Galapagos and put them on round island. Now, we can control their numbers, but we're already seeing that they are making a difference in engineering the island, <coughs> filling that ecologi ecological niche, and helping the island restore. We have some amazing photographs taken maybe 20 years ago and taken today, and you can see the island coming back to life. We're going to be working in Sumatra. This is quite a new project for us, but such is the pressure on biodiversity in Southeast Asia that we could not ignore this. We're working with partners called the uh, Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Programme who are establishing a rehabilitation centre for orangutans just outside the city of Medan. But we're also going to be working there in captive breeding of some of the rarest species that are heavily impacted by illegal trade. Species like the Sumatran laughing thrush, the straw-headed bulbul. We're going to be using the haven as our base in Sumatra to then look at the other work that we can do, perhaps with turtles, perhaps with many different species. But having that base is going to help us work. So you can see there's quite a variety. We're going to go into a little bit more detail now about one of those rewilding sites, the Tarai Arc grasslands. We work there because of this incredibly gorgeous little pig. This is the pygmy hog, tiny, little. Um, 
one feature of Durrell that you might be aware is when we work somewhere, we stay for the long term, because conservation does not happen overnight. Durrell has been working on the pygmy hog since the year I was born. So only 20 years, right? That's, uh... <laughs> no, many, 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 many more years. But that's the kind of a commitment that we need if we're going to save species. Now, the grasslands of the Terai used to run along the entire border of the Himalaya, up the north of India, but it's been broken up. It's under extreme pressure. There's overgrazing, invasive plant species coming in and disrupting the, the grassland, uncontrolled burning. All of that pressure has meant that the system is breaking down. Things are falling apart. So what do we do about it? Well, we're working with local communities and helping them develop different strategies for their cattle. We're working with the forestry department and helping them understand how to remove the invasive plants and how to use controlled burning to rejuvenate the grassland, because burning is important for grassland systems. And of course, we are putting the hogs back. We've been working for many years. We have captive breeding centers in Assam where we breed the hogs, and then we take them. This is a, a release pen. We take them to the release pen and let them acclimatize for a little bit, and then we let them go. You can see they've got little ear tags in, so we can track them and know where our little hogs are going. Uh, in May this year, we released our 108th pygmy hog back to the wild. But for all of this to really work, we can intervene with uh, controlled burning, we can intervene with controlling invasive species, but what we really need for the Terai Arc grasslands is for the big herbivores to come back in large numbers, because they are the engineers of that landscape. So I'm going to show you some of our camera trap pictures from this year, because it's beginning to happen. So we want to look after pygmy hogs. This is a hog deer. Fabulous, gorgeous little herbivores coming back in greater numbers. It's not only those ones, though. Elephants and rhinos are coming back. If we can continue this process and make sure that we make the environment right for them, they will come back and do the job for us. They will come back and they will regulate the ecosystem. Very excitingly for us, the big blob, that's one of our released um, hogs from earlier this year. And if you can look between her legs, these are the piglets that were born in the wild. So they're back and they're breeding and hopefully we can sustain them. But of course, you need your large herbivores to regulate the ecosystem, but you need something to regulate the herbivores. Every system needs its top predators. And earlier this year, we started to see pug marks of this one, the jewel in the crown of India's wildlife. So if you want to save a pygmy hog, you have to save a pygmy hog's world, which means you save a tiger's world. And that's how rewilding really works. So that's the rewilding sites, but what's our approach? At Durrell, we have four pillars. Uh, we have our zoo. We have our field programs, we have our training center, and underpinning all of those parts is our science. So our training center will be working hard in making sure that we have those 500 projects working more effectively. Our zoo and our field programs, underpinned by science, will be working towards that million people better connected to nature, 100 species on the road to recovery, and 10 ecosystems being rewilded. We put that all together, then we can upscale our activities. Rewilding is really an idea whose time has come, but I think we're rather unique in that we have these four pillars that we can bring to the subject of rewilding. Our zoo in Jersey, I hope some of you have visited. Sometimes it looks a little bit like an arboretum, very wooded, which is fantastic. But our zoo in Jersey is where we really practice our skills of captive breeding, learning about species, working out how we can breed them, look after their health, to ultimately put them back in the wild. And our keepers often go to our field sites as well to take their skills there. Our zoo, of course, is one of the places where we can connect people to nature. This is the rarest bat in the world. This is the Livingston's fruit bat. And we have actually quite a sizable proportion of all the Livingston fruit bats in the world. We have a fantastic bat house. But it's very interesting when you meet people 
they often say, I don't like bats. I don't like bats. Bats are creepy. Bats are creatures of the night. There's something wrong with bats. And yet, when people come into our bat house and they meet our bats and they're chattering and they're squabbling for territory and they're messing around, basically, they come out and they don't say, I like bats. They say, I love bats. <laughs> it's a transformational experience. Our training centres, we have one in Jersey and one in Mauritius. Mother Nature needs her daughters and her sons. And we want to train the next generation of conservationists. And we want to improve all our partner NGOs, help them to be the best they can be, whilst also training our own staff. And we feel that's a very important part of our work. Conservation does not happen without people, of course. We have about 160 staff. We're quite a small NGO. This is Carl Jones, our chief scientist. He is a rock star of conservation. He doesn't like it when I say that. I have called him Mick Jagger before. But <laughs> last year, Carl won the Indianapolis Prize. That is the Nobel Prize of Conservation. And it's a real badge of honor for us that our team are held in such high esteem. Just this year, two of our team, Parag Decker, who heads up our Pygmy Hog project, and Ernest Beccarani, who heads up the work around our plowshares, they were awarded Disney Conservation Heroes Awards, and they are all heroes. So it's that commitment and passion that really makes this work. Our global influence, we want to lead the way with science, and that's the science of endangered species recovery. And we publish, and we talk to colleagues, and we work with collaborators. We share our knowledge, and we're building a global practitioner network. We have around 5,000 alumni from our training. And we're making sure they're all linked together, discussing their work, helping each other in whatever country they're working. Our amphibian projects go across all that we do. Amphibians are a group that are under great threat. So we, we wanted to make sure we worked globally on amphibians. And we're also scaling up small mammal conservation. Now, don't let the word small fool you. Half of the world's mammals are small mammals, 3,000 species. And we're leading the way in the assessment of their status, the programs to help get them up and running. We're working with partners everywhere. Do we have an impact? It's very important. Now, I think probably I just need to leave this quote up here to say, everything's fine because Sir David thinks we're OK. <laughs> <laughs> he very kindly said this on the occasion of our 50th anniversary. But we do also make sure that we're doing well ourselves. And we do that by the Durrell Index. The index is our measure of how effectively we're impacting. That top line is the status of the species we work with. The bottom red line is what would have happened if we had never worked on these species. That's called the counterfactual line. The gap is the difference that we make. So we're confident that through our work and with our partners, we actually make a difference for conservation. We can't do that, of course, without our supporters. We thought long and hard about what animal picture to put on our supporter slide. <laughs> this is Badongo, our incredibly handsome silverback gorilla. I was a gorilla keeper many, many years ago. Though not all gorillas look alike, Badongo is particularly handsome, we like to think. Um, and it's thanks to people like you that we can do our work, that we can really get out there and uh, make a difference in the world. There's so many supporters we could thank, but we wanted to make a mention of the Balcom Charitable Trust who supported the development of this strategy. So these were the headline mission aims. How can you help? This is the ask. <laughs> With your help, 10 pounds, buy six tags for reptiles and Mauritius so we can work out where we're going, work out what's happening, how effectively they're moving around the island. £100 will we'll buy a GPS-enabled smartphone so our teams out in the field can collect data more effectively. £500 pays for a community festival in Madagascar, helps the community get behind the projects, gets them involved in looking after their own environments. And if you're particularly flush this evening, £1 million <laughs> will rewild the Assamese grasslands for the next five years. You will bring back tigers, you will bring back rhinos, and most importantly, you'll bring back hogs. 
Now, I hope that you're as excited about our strategy as we are, about our vision for a wilder, healthier, more colourful world. It's an optimistic strategy, but we believe we can do this. In fact, we're convinced we can do this, but we can only do this with your help. So I hope you're going to join us on the journey. Thank you.